So much more than your average book club. This is the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. Judy, are you making the tea? I made it last time. It's your turn. Oh, come on. I'm really, really comfy and I'm really, really thirsty. And really, really lazy. Get up. I want a cup now and a biscuit. All right. Actually, my dove, we'll both have to move because they're playing our song, which means it's podcast time again. Hello, I'm Emma Healy and I'm an author, ex-bookseller, ex-librarian, uh, ex-bookbinder. And don't forget you can download each and every book via Kobo for your e-reader or your smartphone via the Kobo app. I must say that when I started reading this book, I wondered if, with a central character who was being eroded by dementia, um, if it could sustain as a story, because clearly she's going to get more and more forgetful and you know, detached from real life as, as the pages turn. But what is brilliant about this book is we go back in time with her and into her memories, which are completely cogent about her youth, you know, her girlhood and when, when she's a young woman. And it's beautifully descriptive about life in post-war England. Um, and I thought that really kind of gave the book the spine. And it made all the, the sometimes quite funny stuff, actually, about the dementia. She does write with, with good humour and also the tragic stuff. It made it, it made it believable and bearable mm. because you have this, this strong backstory coming through. It's very interesting, isn't it, that dementia is becoming more and more in the forefront of our minds as we read more and more mm. about it, uh, very worrying stuff about it in the press, um, and as we all get older and as we are faced with a, a rapidly ageing population. And a young woman like Emma, mm. who's only 29, mm. has chosen it as the subject of her first novel. Yes, and what uh, she's done, I think, re and I really appreciated this, actually, and, and for anyone who has a family where dementia is an issue, and that's about two-thirds, it actually gives, the story actually gives dignity to the central character who is being destroyed by dementia because her belief that Elizabeth is missing, the title of the book, isn't a kind of a fantasy or a, or a mistake because of the disease. It's true. She's right. A woman has gone missing. And although she's finding it so hard to kind of nail down the realities of that, she is right. And, and initially, everybody discounts her and says, in fact, all the way through the book, people discount her and say, you're rambling, you're not making sense, or they say that behind her back. But actually, she's right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part of her brain that's still functioning. And that gives her a kind of dignity and a purpose, you know? Yeah, and if there's any any comfort to be drawn from the idea of dementia, it is that what Emma is saying is that somehow the inner core, the absolute inner kernel of a person is still there, is not destroyed by dementia. Well, until the very end. Until the very end, yes, I know. It's a very good book. So I'm just going to read a section of Elizabeth is Missing. This is the prologue, so it's just right at the beginning of the book. Uh, not really very much introduction necessary. Maud? Was I boring you so much that you'd rather stand outside in the dark? A woman calls to me from the warm light of a cluttered dining room. My breath curls towards her, wet and ghostly, but no words follow. The snow, sparse but bright on the ground, reflects the light onto her face, which is drawn tight in an attempt to see. I know, though, that she can't see very well, even in the daylight. Now, this is one of the cleverest mysteries that either of us has read in a long time. And it has an absolutely terrific and very sort of modish premise. Maud, who's uh, falling into the grip of dementia, nevertheless knows and remembers something with absolute conviction. And it's this. Elizabeth is missing. And she won't stop telling people, even if they think she's rambling and talking rubbish. So somehow Maud herself, all by herself, in her head, has to travel back 70 years in time to solve the riddle. And it is utterly absorbing. And congratulations, Emma. I mean, it's a, it's a tour de force, it really is. Oh, thank you very much. Grips you from page one. I wondered, reading it, if you'd be able to sustain it, because this woman has got dementia and it's getting worse as, as the book progresses. And you'd think, well, how can you sustain a story when the reality is slipping through this, this poor woman's fingers? But you do. What made you decide to do it? Because it was such a challenge to write. Yeah, yeah, it was a challenge. Actually, I wondered whether I'd be able to sustain it as well. Um, it was really just because I felt the story was so important to me. My grandmother has multi-infarct dementia, mm. and she was the trigger for it. I was in the car with her and my dad one day, and she said, my friend is missing, and I thought that was interesting. It turned out her friend wasn't missing. Her friend was just staying with her daughter in another town. But the idea of it kept going around in my head. What if this woman really had been missing? What if my grandmother hadn't been able to retain the answer? She was in the early stages of dementia then, but within a few years, 
I was quite certain she wouldn't have been able to remember. She also found out uh, where her friend was through other mutual friends, and within a year or so, those had kind of scattered. They'd gone into homes or gone to live with family or died. Mm. Mm. So it's that kind of moment of isolation as well I was really interested in. Come inside, she says. It's freezing. I promise I won't say another word about frogs and snails and majolica wear. I wasn't bored, I say, realising too late that she's joking. I'll be there in a minute. I'm just looking for something. In my hand is the thing I've already found, still clotted with mud. A small thing, easily missed. The broken lid of an old compact. It's silver tarnished, its navy blue enamel no longer glassy but scratched and dull. The mildewed mirror is like a window on a faded world, like a porthole looking out under the ocean. It makes me squirm with memories. I was very interested in, in one of the things that you, you wrote when we asked you questions at the back of the book, which is that you did quite a lot of research. Obviously, you'd have to, uh, I mean, you look about 10. <laughs> Um, how old are you, actually, in your early 30s? I'm 29. You're 29? Mm. My God. Um, anyway, but obviously you had to do... They do exist a... out there, Judy. There are, <laughs> really? there are 20 somethings yes, <laughs> on the planet. So, so, so you obviously didn't know that much about dementia, the disease, but you had to learn loads of it. And one of the interesting things you found out about it was um, people's patterns in life. Uh, even though uh, they have lost their memory, even though they're very confused, they tend to continue with the same patterns. And you gave the um, analogy of a, of a gardener. And you said that a gardener with dementia will still go out to the garden every day intending to prune the roses, even though there are no more roses, no roses there. That's really interesting. Did, is, did, did you observe that kind of thing in your own grandmother? Yeah, there were definitely things that she repeated often. So uh, towards kind of the last uh, couple of years, I mean, before she moves into a home where she's actually kind of, she's kind of changed again. Um, she constantly told us that her husband, who'd been dead for about 15 years, was at the pub and she was worried about when he'd be home and how mm. late it would be and, yeah. um, and whether, you know, what would happen and whether, um, whether she should go and get him or it was that kind of repeated thing. And that was obviously something that had worried her when she was more compass mentis. Yes. Um, yeah. And she's repeating the pattern, as Judy said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I'm, I kind of... I was really interested in that and I thought that was something I could play with and I knew that I wanted another story in the book that would be uh, more lucid because mm. I, I thought it was quite a difficult journey to ask your reader to go on with you. Here's someone whose mind is in decline and is quite upsetting at times. Mm. So there had to be a really good story as well. There had to be something else that was... Uh, yes, I should explain that, that, that when you do go back in, in time, you go back as far as 70 years before, what you write there are very lucid memories, um, as it were, actual happenstances happening, so that there is a strong spine to the book. It's not just, as you say, um, this very interesting, but sometimes, yes, a little depressing, as it has to be, um, discussions about her dementia. But you go back in time and you see her as a young woman, as a young girl, and, and, and everything's completely joined up. And, and, and that's, a, that's, that's you're right, that's necessary to the story. But your, your grasp of what it was like 70 years ago, the fashions, you know, um, the music, the, 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 the slang, the conversations, is pin sharp. I mean, it really is. How, how have you done that? I mean, was that all done online, or did you go out and buy books from the period, or what? Because it's really good. Oh, thank you. Well, part of it was from my other grandmother who's sort of the other inspiration. So the book is dedicated to both grandmothers. Um, some of that was from her. Uh, she died when I was about a year into writing the book and when I was really struggling with the backstory. Mm. And I felt slightly that, I don't know, that I kind of couldn't make that backstory real. And then uh, I found out she was dying. We went to the hospital and I had a two hour journey to get to the hospital to see her. And I didn't know what to do. I couldn't read, I couldn't concentrate. So instead I wrote every story that I could remember her telling me um, about her early life. And when I got to the hospital, I went through those stories with her and she loved to reminisce and mm. it was a nice thing to do, but it also um, meant I could fact check and make sure I got the names right and things. It's been kept in the atmosphere of the time. I mean, you're a child of the internet and a child of mobile phone and, you know, <laughs> social network. Well, you are, and social networking. And that's the reality that, that, that we all live in now, but you, you've kind of grown into. And you're writing about the period way before that, um, but you write about it in a very kind of contemporary way. It's really good. Yeah, I, I read a lot of diaries from that time, ah, so okay. quite a lot of things have been published recently from 1946. Um, and there's been all the kind of mass observation stuff, Nella Last and um, people like that, so that's been really useful. Some of it I 
waited until I had that information and then wrote a scene. And some of it I wrote a scene and then Left checked gaps. things. Yeah, yeah. Or just things like, for instance, I couldn't. I couldn't find a reference to oven gloves anywhere. And I thought, did they have oven gloves? That seems such a basic thing, but I couldn't. And then I even asked my mum, could she remember from her early childhood? Because I thought that would give me a clue. I couldn't find a reference. And in the end, I just took, a, took them out. They use a rag. People yeah. use a rag now. People use a dishcloth now. Actually, I can't remember <laughs> well, I think Did that people I don't, have, did I don't, my mother ever right, use an oven glove? I don't glove? think we did, because looking back to my childhood in the 60s, um, my mum used a dishcloth because surely oven gloves were developed with asbestos, weren't they? Yes, they were. Yeah, mind you, that existed. But that existed, and in fact, my my uh, my grandmother used to talk about asbestos fingers. Yeah, you see what so you've done. Getting yeah. burned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, that's, that's the thing. It's yeah. kind of the kind of black hole that you can fall down when you're researching. Absolutely, yes, so absolutely. chuck it out. <laughs> now, t just talking about your second, your other grandmother, the one you visited in hospital, and you, so she, there was no sign of dementia in her. No, she was absolutely compass mentis to the end. Right. And so her stories were really, really lucid and uh, and really helpful, and it was. Uh, it was because of that that I felt like I had the kind of confidence to depict another time. What have you lost? The woman steps, precarious and trembling, out onto the patio. Can I help? I might not be able to see it, but I can probably manage to trip over it if it's not too well hidden. I smile, but I don't move from the grass. Snow has collected on the ridges of a shoe print and it looks like a tiny dinosaur fossil freshly uncovered. I clutch at the compact lid in my hand, soil tightening my skin as it dries. I've missed this tiny thing for nearly 70 years and now the earth, made sludgy and chewable with the melting snow, has spat out a relic, spat it into my hand. But where from? That's what I can't discover. Where did it lie before it became the gristle in the earth's meal? An ancient noise like a fox bark makes an attempt at the edges of my brain. Elizabeth, I ask, did you ever grow marrows? Do you find it at your age, um, your tender age, thinking about your, your grandmother, um, the one with dementia, do you find it an infinitely depressing prospect? Um, I mean, do, 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 do you kind of dread the same thing happening to you? Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I started to write the book as I thought it would be kind of cathartic. I thought maybe mm. if I wrote about it, and I really, it's like kind of like staring it out, I thought maybe that would uh, be helpful. I'm not, I can't really say that I feel that way after writing it. I definitely yeah. feel, I don't necessarily find it terrifying for me. I'm absolutely terrified of my parents getting it. The yeah. idea that suddenly they wouldn't recognise me or... Yeah. I, I, would that, I just think you rely so much on people who are close to you to remember things about you. So if you've had a bad day at work, you need to you need them to remember that you don't yes. like your boss in order for them to sympathise properly. Yeah. If they don't remember anything about it, even but if I, they're kind, they can't. Yes, really... but not to diminish it because it is a terrible disease. But my own mother's just died of it, and, and other things as well. Um, and it wasn't that it wasn't as bad as I was expecting it to be. I mean, the way that you've just spoken about it's exactly how I was dreading it when when it was first diagnosed. But you know, it wasn't that bad. And, and sometimes it was quite funny. You know, I mean, she thought I was her kid brother, Bailey, didn't she, for, for, for a long yes. time? And she used to say things which were quite amusing. And then she'd realise. But you your know, mother died quite soon into yes, it was, the it, progression. Yes, it was mid-progression, mid I, I would yeah. say. But it wasn't. It mm. wasn't. What I and and I was reading this book as she was dying of it. But what I liked about it is, and maybe you intended to do this almost subliminally, you do give dignity to to Maud with her dementia because actually she's right. Elizabeth is missing <laughs> and her suspicions are well founded and she does in her own way, in her own broken way, she does sort it out, you know. So actually even though she's losing her credibility as a, as a human being, which is what dementia does to you, she's still right and she's still, she's still got a role to play despite it and I thought that was great. Oh thank you, well, that was really important to me. Yeah. I wanted her to be relevant. You know? Exactly. She's yes. not just kind of Often her own fantasies. There was something real mm. behind it, mm. um, and yeah, that was really and and the humour was important as well. When yes. I did all the research, I did showed people use humour constantly to get through any difficult moments, which people do with everything. I mean, you know, Absolutely. look all the, the jokes from the First World War. People use humour, and I didn't want that to be left out either. No. But no. yeah, I was really I wanted to make sure that she uh, had dignity, like you say. There mm. are there are moments where that's very there's a kind of moment where she. Uh, needs the loo and it's very upsetting very early in the book but I wanted that to kind of be something that you got over as a reader and then you got hmm. you know there's the kind of shock of 
getting old, but then there's actually the just living and being a person, a real person. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well congratulations it on it. Uh, you, yeah. you, it's, it's beautifully written as well. It's, uh, it's a very easy read um, and utterly absorbing and, uh, in the end, extremely satisfying in terms of the conclusion. It's great. Okay. It's called Elizabeth is Missing. We're talking to the author, Emma Healy, uh, available pretty much everywhere. Um, but if you do get it from WH Smith, as we always point out, you will get, and only there in WH, you will get the extra content in the back, which includes the Q&A that, uh, that we write with the, the authors, and they're really interesting. Um, try not to read them until you finish the end of the book, though, because otherwise it might spoil it slightly for you. <laughs> there you go. Tell us what titles you've enjoyed on the Richard and Judy Book Club. Find us on Facebook slash Richard and Judy Book Club or tweet us at RJ Book Club News. From the Richard and Judy Book Club, I read A Limb with Barkley, No Time for Goodbye. It was an absolute page turner from the word go. There were so many twists and turns and I never once guessed the ending. Lots of detail about the characters and just the plot was amazing and I would definitely recommend him as an author. The book that I would recommend uh, to read is the autobiography by Gareth Thomas. I think it's a really fascinating read, really well written about his life, um, his rugby ways from, and his come to terms with his own sexuality, which I think is a real, um, there's a real positive message throughout the book, basically coming out and, and being true to yourself and who you are as, as an individual in society. Um, and it goes through some dark sequences, how he came to terms with nearly committing suicide and things like that and how he kind of got himself back on top with his rugby playing and coming to terms with telling the public about his sexuality. So it's a fantastic read. Loads of great twists and turns within the, the whole book. I read the memory book. I thought it was really sad, but really made me understand a lot about um, Alzheimer's because that's my granddad died of that this year. So there was a lot of stuff in there and it was a love story and it, and it gave you the perspective of looking at it from her point of view, her children's point of view, her husband's point of view and her mother's. And all the, the, the sort of hang-ups that they had before, they all seemed to sort of work out in the end. It was just, it was just a lovely book. I loved it. And as always with WH Smith, we do like to give you a bit extra. So let's find out a little more about Emma Healy. I do feel that there are things that I tend to need to know about what I'm writing to kind of get anywhere. So I feel like I tend to think in kind of scenes, if you like. And so if I can't think of how I could represent something in a scene, that storyline isn't going to work. Um, and I, I'm always interested in mystery in some way. So that doesn't necessarily mean crime, but I feel like there has to be a question and then an answer. So if I can't think of the answer, or if I don't think I will ever be able to think of the answer, then I guess that that's kind of off-putting. Um, and also the other thing I always need to do is uh, be able to hear dialogue. And quite often, unless I can hear two characters having dialogue at cross purposes where they're not really answering each other, and I feel like that's more like a real conversation, um, then those characters never become real for me. I have a lot of ideas all the time that I think, oh, that would be great, that would be great. But then um, I'm very strict with myself about whether I'm going to use them. So, uh, for instance, maybe I think it's too far removed from my life. I don't feel I'd be able to give any extra insight into it. Um, and I feel someone else would do that job better. Something like, That's something I worried about a lot, about writing the story of an 82-year-old. I really felt, was I able to give anything extra? And in the end, I sort of had to decide that I was um, but that's one of the questions or whether I can actually hear that voice where that voice feels real I can get inside that person's head whether there's anything more to add sometimes you'll read a piece in the paper and you'll think gosh that's really fascinating um, but actually the whole everything is there in that article so really making fiction about it is kind of self-indulgent rather than useful to the reader so yeah I have tons of ideas that I play with and then decide that are impossible to actually do anything with, for me anyway. One of the things that I always say is that writing is, uh, takes a lot of willpower. So I think a lot of people try and do too many things at once. Quite often writing a novel or writing in general is one of the um, New Year's resolutions. And it is one of them alongside, you know, giving up alcohol or going to the gym or going on a diet. Uh, all of those things are things I've also put on my uh, New Year's resolutions list. 
but actually you can't do all of them and I think it's really important if you're serious about writing that you aren't serious about going to the gym so so I guess my my advice is don't try to do too many things I, they've actually proved that willpower is a kind of finite resource so if you use it all up on giving up alcohol you won't have enough willpower to write and it ta- it does take a lot so so yeah be unhealthy but write <laughs> Next up, a familiar face has turned to murder for his latest book. Hello, I'm Tony Parsons. I'm an award-winning journalist and a best-selling novelist. And I left school at the age of 16 with one plan, to write, to tell stories. And that's what I did. Join us and Tony Parsons on the next episode of the Richard and Judy Book Club podcast, exclusive to WH Smith. Want to dip into a new book? Get much more than at any other bookshop. With extra notes at the back of every recommendation exclusive for WH Smith, check out the collection in-store and online and enjoy another great read with Richard and Judy.